Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here. Let me introduce Alex Padilla. Only the good stuff, right? Uh, this is our council president who oversees uh, the city council and uh, presides over the council meetings, assigns committees at the uh, city. Uh, he is from Pacoima in San Fernando, in the San Fernando Valley. He attended LAUSD schools uh, where he graduated from San Fernando High School. Upon gra graduation, he went to uh, Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. We, 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 we didn't get into Loyola Marymount. <laughs> 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 it was our mistake, but you know, he's, he's been able to overcome it. Well, Fernando's letter of recommendation didn't work here, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, he studied mechanical engineering. I'm doing pretty good, huh? And this is a lot of script. Uh, he studied mechanical engineering. Uh, after graduation, he, uh, he worked for some time with Senator Barbara Boxer. He's a Coral Fellow. And uh, he ran for city council on a special election uh, senator to replace who is now Senator Alarcón. Uh, he was elected as one of the youngest council members uh, in the history of the city council. And he quickly, uh, his colleagues had the confidence in him to vote for him as the council president. He was also one of the youngest ever uh, city council presidents. And uh, he is in his sixth year of serving at the city council. And I think what is even more impressive is that uh, he is not only one of the youngest, and he's not only the president, but he is the um, most senior member of the council. Given term limits, many city council members have gone and come. So this is our city council president, Alex Padilla. I, I want him to keep going. You know? <laughs> well, what we've been through, after what we've been through the last couple of days, I think uh, <laughs> We may be ready for this. Well, it's my honor to introduce my friend and, and colleague, the president of the Board of Education for the LA Unified School District, the Honorable Jose Huizar. Uh, Jose was actually born in Mexico, in the state of Zacatecas, but came here uh, when he was young, uh, also a, a product of LA Public Schools, at least until the eighth grade. Uh, we were just at Euclid Elementary, his elementary school, earlier today. Uh, he made a transition from public schools to private schools on his own will, uh, and there's a story behind it that maybe will come up in the conversation. Uh, but he put himself through uh, Salesian High School uh, to graduate from high school. I've heard of people putting themselves through college, but never of people putting themselves through high school. Uh, but that education foundation allowed him to go on to earn degrees from UC Berkeley, from uh, Princeton as well, and from Harvard. Another guy, UCLA. UCLA, <laughs> the Harvard of the East Coast. Um, and uh, now he, he's come back, he's worked as an attorney in Los Angeles, ran for a uh, school board in, in the year 2001. And two years later, in 2003, uh, was elected by his college to serve as president of the school board, uh, which is a tremendous responsibility. Uh, the school board is only seven members for a jurisdiction that's actually larger than the city of Los Angeles. Uh, has a six billion dollar budget uh, beyond $6 billion every year, only seven members that are technically part-time, if you can believe that, uh, to oversee that budget, to oversee the school district, and oversee uh, one of the largest public works infrastructure projects in America today. They're building 160 schools simultaneously. So aside from that six-plus uh, billion dollar budget, they have another $13, $14 billion capital pro uh, program uh, going on at the school district. Uh, so that's what Jose tries to do uh, when uh, he's not working as attorney, supporting his family, and when he's not spending time with his family. He's uh, married to his wife, Rochelle. They have two young daughters, and, uh, and I consider him a good friend. Well, that seems pretty Born in Tijuana, uh, but raised in is it Barrio Logan, uh, in San Diego, uh, 
And actually, as you were growing up, they just kept bouncing over the border, back and forth, in a legal way, you know, living in one place, <laughs> uh, going, to, going to school in another. Uh, he'd like to tell stories about how he wore high waters when he was a kid going to school, and uh, I think that's probably something the three of us have in common, not having uh, necessarily the, the best uh, in life from a financial standpoint, but uh, he shares our, our humble beginnings, and that's really what I think uh, forced all of us to commit ourselves to uh, public service in life, and uh, respectively, we are now the, the leaders of our three respective bodies. Fabian is the Speaker of the California State Assembly. Uh, also as a president of the school board, I serve as a president of the city council, and we try to do things together once in a while, not just from a policy standpoint, but whether it's uh, a speaking engagement like this, or hosting receptions, or, or honoring people, and the kick that I get is people will ask me, why are you guys doing the Latino thing again? It's, you know, Nunez, and we saw it in Padilla, and we're like, no, 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 hold on, hold on. This is the speaker of the assembly, and the president of the school board, and the president of the city council coming together on something, heaven forbid, our leaders are actually talking to each other and working together. And yeah, we're proud to be Latino, but uh, this is about doing our jobs. Fabian, is, uh, he started working uh, with many labor organizations. Uh, I'm not quite sure which ones, but I think he went from, he was with the hotel workers for some time and then went to work for, as a government relations person for the County Federation of Labor. Uh, prior to being elected uh, for the 46th Assembly District, uh, Fabian, uh, the speaker, worked for two years as a government relations officer for the Los Angeles Unified Los Angeles. School District. Yes, for two years, well, one year when I was there and one year while uh, prior to that. And uh, he represented the 46th Assembly District uh, uh, constitutes downtown Los Angeles, Boyle Heights, uh, Huntington Park, and portions of East Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the Speaker of the Assembly, Fabian Nunez. <laughs> well, to get, to get us started in a formal way, I'm actually going to ask uh, Father Otten to come up here and maybe say a, a, a couple of words. Uh, this will be on the exam. So <laughs> We already did the introductions, okay, so sorry. Uh, the only thing I remember about the introductions is they said that when you were growing up, you wore high water. <laughs> That's the only thing I remember. Well, not high heels. <laughs> not high heels. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we start with you, Jose. T tell us a little bit about uh, the school district, the infrastructure issues, and, and what you're facing. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks, uh, Fernando, for uh, having us here today. I think it's so important as we not only talk to your students here, but that we all continue to uh, talk about how we're uh, building Los Angeles and Southern California, and not only in its physical infrastructure, but many other ways, uh, however we define uh, uh, infrastructure, this human infrastructure and uh, the bricks and mortar, as we call it. Uh, one of the most interesting things right now at the Los Angeles Unified School District, although raising student achievement and having prepared graduates is our number one responsibility. One of the things we're focused on today is to build more schools, to build the physical infrastructure where our students could learn. 
And it's, inter it's an interesting time in history for the school district and the city and the many cities it represents because it not only uh, encompasses the city of Los Angeles, but in one way or another overlaps about 20 other cities uh, near the city of Los Angeles. And what's interesting right now is that we are making history in the city of Los Angeles and LAUSD and the other cities. Uh, for 30 years, the district built very few schools or practically no schools. And as our student population kept growing each and every year, there were different short-term solutions that were found to house the students on our campuses. Uh, I think uh, I heard a statistic that in the last 15 years or so, our student population had risen about 8,000 students per year. And as a solution to uh, the new number of students that, that were arriving, uh, the district um, decided to do several things but build schools. First, let me tell you about what we are building. We are building 160 new schools in the next eight years. I don't think in the, at any time in the history of the school district, or for that matter, the history of the, this country or the world, have so many schools been planned to be built in, short, in such a short period of time. That's good news. And like I said, for 30 years, there are practically no schools that had been built. One of the reasons that I believe uh, the schools had not been built is um, funding. A lot of times, obviously, or not all, but most of the time, you need the funding and you need your resources to build the schools. One of the things that has allowed us now to have a program of this magnitude is that we've changed the way that schools are provided the funding to, uh, to build the schools. In the past, it would take a, uh, a super majority uh, for us to pass bonds to get the money to build the schools. Uh, a few years ago, we passed Proposition 39, which lowered the threshold to a simple majority, to actually 55%. So that allowed us to go out to the voters and, and pass bonds more easily. Another reason why I think we are now been able to build so many schools is because of uh, the, this Board of Education's willingness to use its M&A domain powers. In the past, when you have such a highly dense uh, geographic area with very few places to build schools and very few vacant property, you, we would have to, more often than not, use our eminent domain powers to take the property to build the schools. And in the past, at least from what I've heard, there's been a reluctance to use that power to take the property and build the schools. But this, this Board of Education, or the last few Boards of Education in the last few years have been willing to do that uh, and do the negotiation required to negotiate with the residential owners, the co commercial property owners, to, make, uh, to have the property available to build the schools. Hey, Jose, explain to the students a little bit better what eminent domain is. Okay. Some of them may not know that. Uh, most public agencies, if not all, have the ability to take a person's private property, if, and if you really think about it, it's a very powerful power to have or authority because you're going in and taking somebody's property. And we know that uh, not only for us personally, but uh, in our culture as American citizens, we hold that very near and dear to our hearts is a person's ability to own property. And uh, so public agencies have the ability for a public purpose to take a, purpose, uh, a person's property if, uh, if, uh, if it's for a public purpose. Usually if a public entity such as a school district identifies a property and needs for that public purpose, it would first of all negotiate with that owner. Uh, are they willing to sell? Will they sell the property to the public entity to build the schools? If not, and there's some disagreement for, for one reason or another, whether it's price, whether the owners of the property have some sentimental value, uh, you know, value towards the property and don't want to give it up for whatever reason. Then we go to court, we uh, use our eminent domain powers and through litigation, we are able to, to acquire the property. Now our purpose in building 160 new schools is really um, twofold. One is to end what we, what I call, we use different words for this, but what I call to end forced busing. Today, 16,000 children are bused away from their local community, from their local school to other parts of the city because there's not enough space or a seat in their local school. And these kids spend about three to four hours a day on the bus going across town to other parts of the school district where there is uh, an available space for, for them to, to learn. 
Now, we know that that's not good for our students. We have other busing programs in the district, such as for magnet schools. If a child, a student gets into a magnet school and it's outside of the jurisdiction, the school district will provide the busing. We also have uh, choice busing. If a parent wants to, by choice, have their child bus to another school where there's space, we will do that as well. But for many of this ki these kids, they spend the bus, um, they, they spend the hours on the bus where they could be spending that time. And these are some of the kids in our poorest communities who, who need the extra time and support. And many of these kids spend uh, the time on the bus when they could be spending that time in after school programs, uh, participating in, in intervention programs. And most importantly, in my mind, one thing that we do not allow to happen through this busing is that we, are their parents, who are, many of them are public transit dependent, cannot participate in their child's education because the school is across town and really limits their ability to meet the teachers, talk to the teachers, talk to the principals, and get to know the teachers. So our first goal is to end forced busing. We want to build community schools where the parents ha and the students have the choice to attend a local school and not have to be bused across town. Our second goal in building these schools is to end what we call the year-round multi-track calendars. How many of you attended LAUSD high schools? How many of you attended year-round multi-track calendars? Probably one. Hey, I remember you from last year. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> tough question. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, year-round multi-track calendars was, uh, was um, a result of not building schools and putting more students on a campus by using the school year round. So we created different tracks for students to attend the school. Uh, it was either a three track or a four track. Now this allows the district to put more students on a campus, but what this has created is tremendous inequity, not only amongst the students who attend that campus, but to students who attend a, what we call that your, your typical calendar, uh, uh, fall and spring um, uh, track calendar, a single track calendar, because within the track, you have different in, uh, resources available to certain students at different times. In some of the tracks, you have some of your better teachers because they'd rather choose to teach in certain tracks than others. In some of the tracks, there's only certain courses available, such as the A through G courses that you all know are necessary in order for many of these students to attend college. Um, and when you compare those students who attend multi-track year calendars and, and your single track calendar, the inequity is that those who attend multi-track calendars attend school 17 days a year less of school. It doesn't sound much like much, right? But a student who, have, who had attended from kindergarten to 12th grade a multi-track year-round calendar school, they would have missed approximately one year less of school compared to a student who attended a single track calendar school. So that's a huge inequity. Uh, so w our goal is to end the force busing, end the URL multi-track calendar, create more equity by having all of our schools on a single track calendar school. And uh, with our program that we have in place right now, we should be able to end the force busing within the next two or three years. And um, we're going to get close, but not completely obliter obliterate the year round uh, calendar uh, by the year 2012. It seems like a long way away, but I think we finally have a solution to providing housing to many of our students and providing the infrastructure available to our, our students. Many of us might say, well, a building's a building. What matters is what goes on in the classroom. But I think here you really can see how providing physical space for students kind of does relate to student achievement, does relate to the learning experience of our students, and it relates to the opportunities available to many of our students to learn. I'm not sure how much time I had, so. Yeah, just uh, another minute or two. Oh, okay. Um, and one thing I wanted to finally mention is, uh, like I said earlier, some of the reasons why we did not um, build schools in the past was the funding wasn't there, uh, the willingness to, for, uh, for the board to now use eminent domain powers, and some of the solutions that were, f that were found previously were uh, more busing, in order to deal with the overcrowding. We created the multi-track year-round calendars. And one final thing is we put more bungalows on campuses. I think if you would drive through some of our, more of our schools these days, you would see more and more bungalows throughout our campuses. So we want to be able to provide more open space to our students. And <clears throat> in building these 160 schools, our first phase is 80 schools. We are have identified practically all of those properties uh, to build those 80 schools. 
We've uh, opened 17 schools last year. We're going to open 30, uh, 30, 35 schools this summer. And our second phase, we're currently planning. We're currently trying to uh, identify the sites. That's about 40 schools. And our phase three, which um, we will find, uh, begin to look for the sites by December of this year, that's another 40 schools. Now, our first phase, it was much easier to find the sites. Everybody wanted schools. The city, the students, whether you had kids or not in LUSD, we, everybody realized and knew the overcrowding of our schools. So it's probably easier to use our eminent domain powers. It's probably easier to negotiate with communities to site these schools. Our second phase, we imagine, not only is properly going to be less, but we're really looking in the same communities that are severely overcrowded, and it's going to be tougher to negotiate where we site those schools. And I really think that our third phase is going to be much, much tougher, and it's not going to be easy as it has been to find the sites for the first uh, 100 or 20 schools. Thanks, Jose. Um, before I go to Alex, I just want to remind the students that we also have in our audience is uh, Steve Soboroff, uh, who's president of Playa Vista, but also was chairman of uh, Proposition DB, DB, which was the first uh, bond measure that got us, what was it, $1.2 billion or something like that? So, uh, 1.2 for, for new schools, if you remember that. And I'd also be remiss if I didn't introduce uh, Moctezuma Esparza, who's a producer, director of movies such as Selena, La Bamba. And I'm going to show, show my age because I don't know a lot of his great work that he's done just recently. So my, my apologies, Moctezuma, but thanks for coming. Appreciate that. So now the, the boy from the same neighborhood of La Bamba, uh, <laughs> Alex Padilla, Bacoima. And if you've seen the movie La Bamba, you've gotten a pretty good tour of uh, where I grew up. Uh, anybody here from Pacoima or the Northeast Valley, San Fernando Valley? Where are you from? Granada Hills. Granada Hills. All right, just on the other side of the 405. There's someone over there. Back there? Anybody? No. Whereabouts? Arleta. Arleta. All right. That's close enough. That used to be part of Pacoima, and then they... Freeway came through, they changed the name, and now you have our leader. Um, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to pick up a little bit on where Jose left off, because you know, I'll, I'll subject myself to the criticism that sometimes comes by way of city officials. Wait, you're a council member, or you're running for mayor. What are you doing talking about schools? What are you doing talking about education? And if you want to do that, run for school. Alex, are you running for mayor? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, you know. From our observation, and, and I do uh, say the following in, in the spirit of, of cooperation and collaboration, because Jose and I have, have a great uh, working relationship, and uh, we're, we're embarking on something together as of today. Uh, but from an outsider looking in, in, in trying to be as supportive and, and uh, helpful to the school district for the sake of improving children's education, I've asked myself from my very first campaign six years ago to today, what can we do to help them? What can we do to help them? And you hear uh, candidates and city officials talk about, oh, well, we're funding after school programs, and that's important. You know, we're, we're helping them find where in our communities to uh, exactly build these schools. And, and that's helpful. They have a tremendous uh, construction program, but there's got to be more. And, you know, I, I've taken a step back in talking to Jose and school board members that have come and gone, you know, in the whole six years that I've been on the council. I'm the old timer now. Uh, and I see a couple of things. As, as Jose mentioned, it's the second largest school district in the country, uh, a budget of more than $6 billion, just annual operating budget. Their capital program is in the 13 to $14 billion. There's only seven board members for a jurisdiction larger than the city of L.A., and they're technically part-time, which means you know, school board members have to have a job outside being a school board member so they can support their, themselves and their families. So they're already only paying attention to the school district on a part-time basis. And then you look at the tremendous construction program that they have going on, and they dedicate a significant amount of their time to real estate matters, where it's land acquisitions or eminent domain proceedings or uh, relocation, you know, that sort of thing. And then they still have the school district to try to manage. So you, know, you have the internal politics, you deal with the superintendent, you deal with those kinds of things. Then you have a district that you represent, so there's principals and parents and local school issues that consume some of your time. When you subtract all that out, by the time you get down to paying attention to curriculum and instruction policy issues, would you agree or disagree with me that we have created a, a, a governing structure at the school district that is not, 
ideal. Anybody disagree with that? And so from an I'll outsider... I'll vouch for that. That's from an <laughs> outsider citywide political perspective, uh, you know, that's what I've observed. And uh, I came to Mr. President's uh, office a, a, a few months back and said, you know, there's got to be a way to change this. There's got to be a way to change this. Because it hasn't been for lack of ideas or proposals on how to prove uh, learning, student performance. You know, some people have said, break up the school district. Some people have said, oh, no, school-based management, because decisions need to be made more at the local level. Some people have said, no, charter schools, that's the way to go. Or, you know, if you remember uh, far enough back, there was a LEARN proposal, or, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, the Small Schools Initiative, and all these ideas. And the frustration that I've heard from board members is they propose some bold initiatives, and then there's just a massive resistance from the school district. There's an institution, there's a bureaucracy there, in a neutral sense of the word, not bad or good, it's just the sheer dynamics of a bureaucracy. It has its, its internal politics, it has its external politics. You have, you know, reform-minded people trying to help the school district, and you have uh, other interests like the teachers union and others, and it's, it's incredible to deal with. Uh, well, back in 1997, the city uh, and the council at the time was kicking and screaming went through a process known as charter reform. And basically what happened is a commission was created to not do the day-to-day -day stuff, but the council and the mayor continue to do their job. But uh, a commission was created to take a snapshot on the governing structure of the city. We're, we're governed by a city charter. It hadn't been amended in about, or, or comprehensively looked at in more than 72 years. And a process was established where people that were appointed or elected basically dissected that governing structure and put it back together in a way that was more meaningful as we approached the year 2000. Uh, and it was adopted by the voters. It wasn't perfect, and you had people that agreed with recommended changes, people who disagreed with recommended changes. But the fact of the matter is you went through that exercise, you educated the public in the process, and a new charter was adopted. Well, the school district's been in existence for 152 years, and that process has never happened for the school district. Uh, you know, I expect, I assume, that all the board members have the discretion, the flexibility, the power to make the changes they feel is necessary to, to improve the school district and help students out. But their hands are pretty tied, both because of the, the politics I mentioned earlier, previous policies that have been adopted by school board members that are you know, hard to even figure out or find where they are, let alone undo, a lot of uh, regulations and mandates, respectfully speaking, that come by way of Sacramento whether they're tied with funding or not. You have No Child Left Behind in Washington, D.C., Governor Schwarzenegger taking money out of public education, those sorts of things. And then you just come back to school board members and say, okay, I sympathize with you. We've got to change things. So how can we change things? So what uh, Jose and I have offered as of today is the establishment of a commission that would do what the city went through between 1997 and 1999 for the school district. Uh, so we're taking a little bit of a political risk here because, as you can imagine, there's some people who aren't going to be happy with, you know, pulling up the covers and finding out what's going on underneath. But I think it's something that needs to happen, uh, and we're, we're taking that on as of today. Uh, so I know that's not technically a city issue, but the school district exists via our city charter, so I'll make the, the legal argument that it is a city issue. Uh, in terms of what's before the city, uh, separate from education, sort of the big picture, long-term initiative. Uh, I'll mention a couple of things, some on the governance side, because I think that they're, they're worth mentioning, and then we can talk about some policy issues. On the governance side, it's an interesting time. I was first elected in 1999 uh, to, to fill a vacancy, and I was re-elected in 2001 for my first full four-year term. Uh, term limits were adopted for the city of Los Angeles in 1993, so that's when the clock started ticking on uh, council members. So I'm elected in 99. Come 2001, you had about half the council that was forced to retire due to term limits. Time was up. So you had sort of this turnover of about half the council. Two years later, in 2003, you had the other half of the council turn over because of term limits. So in a period of four years, I went from being the new member to the second senior member, and come this July 1st, I'll be the dean of the city council. The year 2001 also brought us a new controller, a new city attorney, and a new mayor. And I know we're in the middle of a mayor's race and there's talk about potentially another new mayor. So issues aside, you look at from a governance standpoint, the, you know, the turnover that there's been, this transition period of government. Uh, and you know, 
while we've gone through this transition period, we've had you know, good budgets and economic times, and we've gone through bad budgets and economic times. We've been through 9-11. You know, there was a, a proposal to break up the city into multiple jurisdictions, and you know, we overcame that sort of secession question. Or we uh, uh, you know, dismissed one police chief. We hired a new police chief. There's been a lot happening at the, at the city in terms of issues while we've been going through this political uh, or governmental transition period. And I think we've done fairly well uh, when you put it in that context. Uh, so I wanted to mention that on the governance side and, and set aside the fact that we've had uh, our chief legislative analyst, the main advisor to the council, move on to a different job. We had our city clerk for a long time retire. Now there's a new city clerk. So even at the staff level, mm -hmm. there's, there's been a transition. Uh, on the issue side, I think uh, uh, near the top, in addition to education, is public safety. There was a lot of debate last fall uh, leading up to the November election about uh, the shortage of police officers uh, in the city of Los Angeles. We're a city that has half the population of New York, but only has one-fourth the police officers. Uh, and we're also much more spread out than New York. And it's comparable uh, proportions to Chicago and Houston and other big cities in America. Uh, so clearly, uh, under the new chief, Chief Bratton, I think he's done a tremendous job. Crime is down. Uh, but I, I have a sense that we're plateauing. You know, we're, our abilities to reduce crime even further are going to be uh, uh, hampered by the lack of resources, and specifically police officers to put out in communities, not just for the sake of you know, patrol or cracking down on gang-ridden neighborhoods, but really, if we believe in, in community-based policing, that's based on the premise that there's a relationship between the police department and its officers and the community, whether it's, you know, uh, block clubs and neighborhood watches or schools and, and chambers of commerce and that sort of thing. And what we have today is a lot of police officers doing nothing other than responding from 911 call to 911 call, leaving no time to actually get out of the car and establish these relationships. So uh, if, if you're not the most you know, staunch pro-police officer uh, type of person because you believe there's other ways, I agree with you, community-based policing, but even to achieve that, we need more police officers. And we had a measure on the ballot in November that would have provided that, not just for the city of Los Angeles, but for the entire county of Los Angeles, because the numbers are consistent across the county. Uh, there's been a lot of debate and, and disagreement as to, you know, that measure wasn't successful, so should the city try again? Should the city try on its own? Should the county try again? When, how, you know, raise taxes? If not, you know, how do you pump police officers? Those types of things. And, and we don't have the answers yet, but we know we need to do it. So in the meantime, it becomes the number one priority uh, every annual fiscal year budget that we adopt until we find a long-term permanent solution. Uh, there's a couple of other issues that uh, I think also reflect some statewide concerns, whether it's uh, housing uh, and housing affordability uh, or transportation. But I think all in all, the city of Los Angeles is doing fairly well. Uh, uh, you know, we share some of the traffic concerns with other parts of the state, but we're, you know, not making those decisions or even investments in isolation. It's a partnership of the, the, the municipal government, state government, and the federal government. Uh, the one thing that I will tell you that most cities you know, won't even talk a whole lot about publicly, uh, but are just basic, 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 is, are things like where's the water going to come from? Because when you're at home and you turn on the faucet, you expect the water to come out, right? And you expect it not to cost you more than gasoline does. Uh, or when you turn the switch on, you expect the light to turn on and your TV to turn on, where's the power going to come from? You know, if, if you grew up in L.A., you know that the trash truck comes around once a day and you expect the, the trash, you know, to be hauled away once a day. You know, so there's a lot of things that people may not stop and think about that the city is responsible for. Imagine if the power wasn't on. Imagine if the water didn't run. Imagine if the trash didn't get picked up. Imagine if the firefighters didn't respond to 911 calls. Imagine if police didn't call, you know, respond to 911 calls. All the basic, basic things that a lot of people take for granted before we even get into the issues of, you know, how do we create more open space and park and recreation programs for kids? You know, how do we build more housing or expand the subway so that we improve transportation? So I think all in all, the city is doing well. It's not doing perfect. You know, there's a lot more that needs to be done. But we are a growing population, a uh, city of 4 million, and a region that expects to grow by uh, a population the size of the city of Chicago in the next 20 years. So uh, Father Lott mentioned, you know, the decisions that we're making today aren't just impacting tomorrow, but it's impacting the next generation. 25 years from now, you know, where are people going to live? Where are kids going to go to school? Where are people going to work? You know, are we creating jobs to meet this growing population? Where's the water power coming from? Where are we going to put the trash? 
you know, 25 years from now, a lot of those decisions uh, need to be uh, made today or at least be moving in that direction. So uh, just some things to think about. Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I actually have some notes and maybe all these chicken scratch notes all over them, so I don't know that I could even read them anymore. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to try to stick to them only because uh, I want to try and be a little bit coherent in my approach to identifying uh, some of the views that I share uh, with regards to the future of Latinos uh, in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and, and I also want to touch up uh, in the end on a couple of, of points that were made by both uh, Council President Alex Padilla, which I think, you know, the fact that uh, uh, the councilman and the council president is thinking in terms of the infrastructure needs of, uh, of this city is something that uh, is really having a negative imp impact on Latinos. The lack of that type of vision in states like Arizona, for example, where we see a regurgitation of the type of anti-immigrant policies that we saw in the uh, mid-1990s here uh, in Los Angeles, and, and uh, School Board President Jose Huizar, who has done a phenomenal job uh, in terms of ensuring uh, that we are uh, building the necessary schools to house all the, the, the growing needs of students uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our school system. But, you know, the history of, of the city of Los Angeles is very interesting because our city has, is one that has had a history of, of racial and economic segregation. And when you juxtapose that against where we are today in light of the fact that we continue to be one of the most potent cities in the, in the country and certainly in the world, I think we can consider ourselves to be a modern city uh, and, in fact, uh, a modern society. But, you know, a modern society is defined by opportunity. If it provides opportunity for people, then it allows uh, itself to be modern because uh, a third world society is a repressive one. A first world society is one where people continue to escalate up the, uh, up the social and economic ladder. And we can still be proud that that is uh, uh, something that, in fact, I think for all three of us uh, that are on this panel uh, are direct beneficiaries not only of the hard work of other folks that came before us uh, in, uh, in the political ranks, uh, people uh, like Art Torres and Richard Alatorre and Gloria Molina and others who, uh, uh, Richard Polanco and many others who for, uh, for many, many years really broke through the racial barriers where political representation and political participation among Latinos is concerned for many of us here uh, in Los Angeles. Esteban Torres, a former congressman, Esteban Torres is another uh, that comes to mind. Uh, but also the fact that, you know, when you can continue to have the transfer of one generation to the other, where the father is a janitor or a dishwasher, or the mother is a maid, or, you know, a construction worker, a bricklayer, and then the son or daughter is a lawyer or a corporate CEO, or, you know, in, in, in our case, the president of, a, of the second largest school district in the world, uh, or the president of the second largest city in the country or in my case, humbly so, the Speaker of the California State <laughs> Assembly. Um, you know, it is, it is amazing how that which many of us discuss as the American dream as an abstract sort of uh, uh, very general uh, concept is a very concrete, uh, is a very concrete motive that ultimately can be defined by a, a society that is, that is a modern society that allows for opportunity. And that's what I mean when I talk about opportunity. But let me just spend a couple minutes to talk about some of the challenges that, that we face as Latinos. And there's no question that Latinos have almost seam seamlessly climbed to the, the powers of decision making uh, uh, in this city. Uh, I think that even as we speak now, uh, we're on the brink of uh, electing 
only the second, I believe, Latino mayor uh, in the history of, uh, of, our, of our great city. And I think uh, it says a lot about, about where we are today, but it also says a lot about the, the, the process of maturity of, uh, of, this, of this population, of this committee, which uh, I consider myself uh, to be a very, par a very proud representative of, which is to say that I'm a representative for the entire state of California. You see, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you could be a Latino representative, but you would be pigeonholed as a Latino representative, and the only folks that you would be considered, or it would be considered appropriate that you would represent were people who were of the, skin, of the same skin tone that you were. And that's how you were defined. And we have moved far beyond that to where now, uh, as, a, as a community, we're more accepted, that Latinos can make decisions and governance to the benefit of all, not just Latinos. Interestingly enough, uh, we still run across some, some barriers and, and, some, and, some, and some problems. Uh, and I, I'll give you a couple examples of, of some that I, uh, that I uh, uh, some challenges I was faced with in the last election cycle in the last fall, uh, which are pretty interesting when you look at them in the context of all the progress that, that we have made. Um, and that is that there were many Latino candidates running for offices in general elections uh, in, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last cycle, in the fall, five or six of them uh, throughout the state of California. And the number one issue were in the polls, we, our candidates would drop eight to 10 points, which in a political campaign, that's a lot. That's like somebody dropping a real big bomb on you that you did something horrible. Uh, uh, so the horrible is being born Latino? No, here it is. <laughs> here it is. Because folks took a position in support of making sure that we have safe roads and, and highways throughout the state and supported to extend the right to provide a driver's license to someone who is not, who was, who is not in this country legally, works in this country, gets paid in this country, but uh, is not here with, under legal status, pays that pays taxes in this, in, this, uh, in, this, in this country. But the fact that they supported that bill what was done in the campaign is that their allegiance to this country was questioned in the context of supporting you know, the right to allow undocumented persons to have a driver's license. Our candidates dropped nine to 10 points. And, and of course, we had to run some very strong campaigns to change it. And so there are still some biases. In fact, today uh, in the mayor's race, and I continue to tell my friends that progress continues to be made uh, in, in the great city that Los Angeles is, and I'm proud uh, to live in, in this city uh, and to be one uh, with the rest that, uh, that live in it because I got to tell you, uh, to see uh, the immense diversity that we represent, the rich diversity that, that our city represents is, is, just, is just amazing. But let me talk a little bit about Latinos uh, in, in, in sort of a larger context and then I'll focus again on, on this point that I made about us being a strong cultural and political force. And there was a reason why I never said economic force, and I'll get back to that in a minute, because I think Latinos, in fact, are an economic force, uh, generally speaking, but more of an economic force abroad than we are here in, uh, in this country. But Latinos make up for 46.5% of uh, Los Angeles's population, according to the 2000 census. Our population increased 6% between 1990 and 2000, during that during that 10-year period. And while whites in this city compromise, uh, comprise 46.9% of the city's overall population, only 29% of those uh, that participated in the census responded as being white only. In other words, the vast majority of the people in this city are of some mixed descent. They're not necessarily, and in fact, if you look at Folks who you think are strictly white, you say, well, you're white. Turns out they're immigrants. Their parents came from, you know, some place in, uh, in the middle, in, the, in Eastern Europe or, uh, or another uh, uh, European country. And, it, and when you really look at everybody's roots, we really are a city of immigrants, this city of Los Angeles. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, I don't need to mention the fact that it, it's no longer a novelty seeing Latinos in, in important positions of power, but now that we have come to a very important place at the governance level, the real question is, does that translate 
into improving the human condition, not only for Latinos, but for all, uh, for all uh, Angelinos. And it's really a question, I think, how we are judged. Five years ago, 10 years ago, for example, I'm not the first Latino speaker in the history of California. Cruz Bustamante was. And the novelty of being the first Latino speaker sort of gives you a, an aura that you can go across the state and say, I was the first. Uh, as difficult as that is to be able to break through the barrier, you're judged very differently when you're not the first. You're the second, you're the third. I'm not judged by being the first Latino, my legacy uh, will depend upon what I do, how we allocate resources, how effective I am in terms of being able to work with the Republican side of the aisle to make things happen for the state of California, what it is that we can provide in terms of infrastructure, transportation, uh, what are we going to do to improve our public education system, what it is that we're going to do to make sure that we continue to have the best research universities in the world, which we now do here in California. So all of these things that I will be judged by, not so much by being the, the novelty of being the first. And so I think what it is, is that's part of the process of maturity of our community. And what it does to us is it helps us establish our own, our own uh, uh, basic priorities. And I think we all agree, if you listen to, to what Jose uh, uh, Wiesart talked about in terms of education and, and certainly uh, Council President uh, Padilla, that education without question is at the top of our, is at the top of our list and it ought to continue being at the top of our list because for people like me, education really was the big equalizer. If it wasn't for an, oppor an educational opportunity for me to go to college, I'd have never be, be, uh, went, gone to college in the first place. Um, and, so, and so for me, it's a very personal thing. But when you look at Latinos across the state, even though today we have more Latino elected officials than we have ever had in the history of California, among, among all ethnic groups, Latinos have the fewest high school graduates. It's only 64.1% of Latinos between the ages of 18 and 24 actually completed high school in the year 2000. According to a Harvard study, only 60% of California Latinos graduated from high school, and it gets worse for college-bound students. 57% of Latinos who attend college graduate with a degree compared to 81% of their white counterparts. Only 57% of those who actually attend uh, uh, college will, will end up graduating. And so I think one of the, one of the telling things Oh, let me give you one more, a couple more statistics as it relates to the Los Angeles Community College because I think this is important. I just, I just learned this a uh, couple of weeks ago. Los Angeles Community College, which is one of the best community college, co college systems in this country, where Latinos make up an enormous uh, percentage of the student population. Interestingly enough, this past year, only 40 African American students went from an AA degree and transferred to a UC, only 40. And only 300 Latino students out of the total LA Community Co College population, only 300 actually transferred to, to a UC college. Now, needless to say, there were some that transferred to a state college, but those are some of the, uh, but a very small, very small number uh, ended up going to, uh, to a university. Uh, a UC college. And so, and so what it does is it begs the question is how do we approach the problems that we face given our distinct, uh, given our particular experiences, uh, what is it that we're going to do different to make sure that we improve upon the, the social uh, uh, and economic conditions of people around us. And let me just talk for a minute about the, the economic power then, and then I'll, I'll stop right there. Um, you know, it's interesting when you look at Latino, Latinos in general, Latino immigrants here in the United States that are of Mexican descent deliver, I think, I believe it's the third largest source of income to Mexico through remittances. The third largest. It's, it's number one now. It's, it's number, one, number one, my professor uh, tells me, and he must be right, I must be wrong. 
He's, well, an, acad he's an academician. I'm a politician. Wrong. You're not wrong. You just weren't up to date. I'm know. just not up to date. Oh, excuse me, sir. <laughs> you see the difference between the academician and the politician? The second, the second significant point is that for El Salvador and Guatemala, it is also the number one source of of revenues, which means that those countries totally depend upon illegal immigration into the United States so that they can sustain their economies. Interestingly enough, all of us here are big supporters of immigrant rights in California. I've had, you know, at least over the last 18 years in terms of my own trajectory, um, in whatever capacity I've been working in, I have always been very pro-immigrant. But if you look at what's happening today in Arizona, it is the product of poor planning that that state has made, a lot of construction work going on, so there's a lot of availability of low-wage jobs because of the low-wage structure of that, of that state. So it's become a magnet for undocumented immigrants that go there and work, but the state doesn't have the infrastructure to sustain that immigration, something we were, we were able to do here in California in the 60s and 70s, 80s and 90s because of a governor whose name was Pat Brown, who invested in our roads and highways, who invested in our, in our, in our state colleges and our university system. And I, I gotta tell you, as I look at what's happening around this country, I feel an immense responsibility that we are going to have to do something big around transportation infrastructure in the state of California if we truly are going to be competitive, not even at the global level, but in fact with other states. And in Los Angeles in particular is our transportation system. Uh, uh, Alex Padilla mentioned housing, which is a big issue, but another very critical issue that we have got to deal with in this city and in this state is access to health care. Six and a half million people don't have access to health care in the state of California. And it's almost 2 million children under the age of 16 that don't have access to health care. So there's a lot of work that, that we need to do. Um, and I think a first good step for many of us is to celebrate the fact that so many of us now, thanks to uh, the wealth that we have built around the, the culture and the political system that we all have benefited from, that we have a real obligation and responsibility to help think big, think out of the box, and think long-term so that we can put Los Angeles on the map. I think that's the best contribution that Latino leaders can provide the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. What we're gonna do is we're gonna ask some of the students if they have questions, but first I have a couple of questions that my uh, fellow <coughs> professors and I put together. One for all three of you, and it's a very direct question is, um, is there a Latino political agenda? Start with Jose and we'll work our way over here. <laughs> what is that agenda? There's a famous uh, response to that that um, former speaker Cruz Bustamante used to have, and I think he said the agenda for all California, the Latino agenda is the California agenda, uh, that we all want good health care, we all want good schools, we all want good public safety in our communities. Um, I don't think there really is a Latino agenda in general. I mean, we all are looking for the same things. Uh, yes, uh, some of the, um, if you, you could pinpoint to a few policies here and there where you say, well, that is a Latino issue. I mean, you might say it's a Latino issue, such as the reference to um, the uh, undocumented driver's license. Um, but then again, you know, not all the undocumented persons are Latino. Uh, it's been identified as a Latino issue because, yes, most of the, um, uh, the legislators uh, are supporting that and pushing it are Latino. But generally, there is a Latino agenda, but it's one that uh, all of us could agree with. And, uh, you know, I know when I was an activist at UC Berkeley and uh, worked on a number of issues, it's about simple things that we all could believe in, equity and access to college education, uh, good teachers in our classrooms, uh, safe schools, safe neighborhoods. Um, I think we are at a point now where um, it has the, the Latina agenda was probably a, a lot more profound. People said that is a Latino agenda because there were fewer of us and we weren't in positions uh, such as today, but now it's kind of diffused now. 
and it's everybody's agenda. So, uh, Alex, when I hear Jose talk and also Cruz Bustamante, there's some of us in Chicano studies who take that answer and say, okay, so really the Latino agenda is about access, but so you're not changing institutions. And by not changing institutions, you continue to maintain the pattern or the institutionalization of the inequity. So you just won re-election unopposed. Nobody ran against you. It's your term limited out. Because you're doing a good job. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you're doing a great job. And so now he can go out there and forcefully talk about the Latino <coughs> agenda. What, what is, is there a Latino agenda? What is it? Yeah, I think the way Cruz uh, described it to me when I heard the, so the first time it was that the reporter had asked him, so now that you're Speaker of the Assembly, what is the radical Latino agenda? <laughs> and he went out to talk about health care and education for all, you know, and all these good things. And really, I, I believe that too. It's uh, the Latino agenda is the American dream, simply put. Um, in terms of access, you know, access to education, access to health care, uh, you know, that is significant change to the way things have happened, you know, historically. And, and we're not there yet. It's still a battle to, to increase access and maintain access. You know, look at uh, uh, healthy families, for example. Uh, uh, under uh, the Gray Davis administration, a program that created access to health care uh, for so many children throughout the state. You know, one or two years later, all of a sudden, the definitions of who qualifies for that gets changed, and you go from millions to thousands that actually qualify. So just to gain access to something like health care isn't enough. The fight continues to maintain access. It's not a Latino thing. That's just a kid's thing. Uh, you know, and then once you, know, you want to take it to the next level, and you talk about uh, Latinos going on to be elected officials, to be CEOs, to be you know, university professors or, you know, leaders in other capacities, it's not just about having access to those positions, but once we do, once we're in those positions, what kind of institutional change can we bring about? There's two ways to bring about institutional change to keep up with the times. One is from within, and the other is, you know, externally, you know, so bomb throwing, protest, you know, whatever it takes to change an institution. Uh, and it's usually a combination of the two over time that gets significant change. Uh, the Latino agenda, and again, prefacing it by if it's just access, we're not changing the